American Fiction Written in 1925 By Virginia Woolf Excursions into the literature of a foreign country much resemble our travels abroad. Sites that are taken for granted by the inhabitants seem to us astonishing, however well we seem to know the language at home, it sounds differently on the lips of those who have spoken it from birth, and above all, in our desire to get at the heart of the country we seek out whatever it may be that is most unlike what we are used to, and declaring this to be the very essence of the French or American genius proceed to lavish upon it a credulous devotion, to build up upon it a structure of theory which may well amuse, annoy, or even momentarily enlighten those who are French or American by birth. The English tourist in American literature wants above all things something different from what he has at home. For this reason the one American writer whom the English wholeheartedly admire is Walt Whitman. There, you will hear them say, is the real American undisguised. In the whole of English literature there is no figure which resembles his, among all our poetry none in the least comparable to leaves of grass. This very unlikeness becomes a merit, and leads us, as we steep ourselves in the refreshing unfamiliarity, to become less and less able to appreciate Emerson, Lowell, Hawthorne who have had their counterparts among us and drew their culture from our books. The obsession, whether well or ill-founded, fair or unfair in its results, persists at the present moment. To dismiss such distinguished names as those of Henry James, Mr. Herger's Thimer, and Mrs. Wharton would be impossible, but their praises are qualified with the reservation, they are not Americans, they do not give us anything that we have not got already. Thus having qualified the tourist's attitude, in its crudity and one-sidedness, let us begin our excursion into modern American fiction by asking what are the sights we ought to see. Here our bewilderment begins, for the names of so many authors, the titles of so many books, rise at once to the lips. Mr. Dreiser, Mr. Cabell Mississippi Canfield, Mr. Sherwood Anderson Mississippi Hearst, Mr. Sinclair Lewis Mississippi Willicatha, Mr. Ringlardner all have done work which, if time allowed, we should do well to examine carefully, and, if we must concentrate upon two or three at most, it is because, travellers and tourists as we are, it seems best to sketch a theory of the tendency of American fiction from the inspection of a few important books rather than to examine each writer separately by himself. Of all American novelists the most discussed and read in England at the present moment are probably Mr. Sherwood Anderson and Mr. Sinclair Lewis. And among all their fiction we find one volume, a storyteller's story, which, being fact rather than fiction, may serve as interpreter, may help us to guess the nature of American writers' problems before we see them tussled with or solved. Peering over Mr. Sherwood Anderson's shoulder we may get a preliminary view of the world as it looks to the novelist before it is disguised and arranged for the reception of his characters. Indeed, if we look over Mr. Anderson's shoulder, America appears a very strange place. What is it that we see here? A vast continent, scattered here and there with brand new villages which nature has not absorbed into herself with ivy and moss, summer and winter, as in England, but man has built recently, hastily, economically so that the village is like the suburb of a town. The slow English wagons are turned into Ford cars, the primrose banks have become heaps of old tins, the barns sheds of corrugated iron. It is cheap, it is new, it is ugly, it is made of odds and ends, hurriedly flung together, loosely tied in temporary cohesion, that is the burden of Mr. Anderson's complaint. And, he proceeds to ask, how can the imagination of an artist take root here? where this oil is stony and the imagination stubs itself upon the rocks. There is one solution and one only, by being resolutely and defiantly American. Explicitly and implicitly that is the conclusion he reaches, that is the note which turns the discord to harmony. Mr. Anderson is forever repeating over and over like a patient hypnotizing himself, I am the American man. The words rise in his mind with the persistency of a submerged but fundamental desire. Yes. He is the American man, it is a terrible misfortune, it is an enormous opportunity, but for good or for bad, he is the American man. Behold in me the American man striving to become an artist, to become conscious of himself, filled with wonder concerning himself and others, trying to have a good time and not fake a good time. I am not English, Italian, Jew, German, Frenchman, 
Russian. What am I? Yes, we may be excused for repeating, what is he? One thing is certain, whatever the American man may be, he is not English, whatever he may become, he will not become an Englishman. For that is the first step in the process of being American, to be not English. The first step in the education of an American writer is to dismiss the whole army of English words which have marched so long under the command of dead English generals. He must tame and compel to his service the little American words, he must forget all that he learnt in the school of Fielding and Thackeray, he must learn to write as he talks to men in Chicago bar rooms, to men in the factories of Indiana. That is the first step, but the next step is far more difficult. For having decided what he is not, he must proceed to discover what he is. This is the beginning of a stage of acute self-consciousness which manifests itself in writers otherwise poles asunder. Nothing, indeed, surprises the English tourist more than the prevalence of the self-consciousness and the bitterness, for the most part against England, with which it is accompanied. One is reminded constantly of the attitude of another race, still lately subject and still galled by the memory of its chains. Women writers have to meet many of the same problems that beset Americans. They too are conscious of their own peculiarities as a sex, apt to suspect insolence, quick to avenge grievances, eager to shape an art of their own. In both cases all kinds of consciousness, consciousness of self, of race, of sex, of civilization, which have nothing to do with art, have got between them and the paper, with results that are, on the surface at least, unfortunate. It is easy enough to see that Mr. Anderson, for example, would be a much more perfect artist if he could forget that he is an American, he would write better prose if he could use all words impartially, new or old, English or American, classical or slang. Nevertheless as we turn from his autobiography to his fiction we are forced to own, as some women writers also make us own, that to come fresh to the world, to turn a new angle to the light, is so great an achievement that for its sake we can pardon the bitterness, the self-consciousness, the angularity which inevitably go with it. In the triumph of the egg there is some rearrangement of the old elements of art which makes us rub our eyes. The feeling recalls that with which we read Chekhov for the first time. There are no familiar handles to lay hold of in the triumph of the egg. The stories baffle our efforts, slip through our fingers and leave us feeling. Not that it is Mr. Anderson who has failed us, but that we as readers have muffed our work and must go back, like chastened schoolchildren, and spell the lesson over again in the attempt to lay hold of the meaning. Mr. Anderson has bored into that deeper and warmer layer of human nature which it would be frivolous to ticket new or old, American or European. In his determination to be true to the essence of things he has fumbled his way into something genuine, persistent, of universal significance in proof of which he has done what, after all, very few writers succeed in doing, he has made a world of his own. It is a world in which the senses flourish, it is dominated by instincts rather than by ideas, race horses make the hearts of little boys beat high, cornfields flow around the cheap towns like golden seas, illimitable and profound, everywhere boys and girls are dreaming of voyages and adventures and this world of sensuality and instinctive desire is clothed in a warm cloudy atmosphere, wrapped about in a soft caressing envelope, which always seems a little too loose to fit the shape. Pointing to the formlessness of Mr. Anderson's work, the vagueness of his language, his tendency to land his story softly in a bog, the English tourist would say that all this confirms him in his theory of what is to be expected of an American writer of insight and sincerity. The softness, the shamelessness of Mr. Anderson are inevitable since he has scooped out from the heart of America matter which has never been confined in a shell before. He is too much enamored of this precious stuff to squeeze it into any of those old and intricate poems which the art and industry of Europe have secreted. Rather he will leave what he has found exposed, defenseless, naked to scorn and laughter. But if this theory holds good of the work of American novelists, how then are we to account for the novels of Mr. Sinclair Lewis? Does it not explode at the first touch of Babbitt and Main Street and our Mr. Wren like a soap bubble dashed against the edge of a hard mahogany wardrobe? For it is precisely by its hardness, its efficiency, its compactness that Mr. Lewis's work excels. 
yet he also is an American. He also has devoted book after book to the description and elucidation of America. Far from being shaleless, however, his books, one is inclined to say, are all shell. The only doubt is whether he has left any room for the snail. At any rate Babbitt completely refutes the theory that an American writer, writing about America, must necessarily lack the finish, the technique, the power to model and control his material which one might suppose to be the bequest of an old civilization to its artists. In all these respects, Babbitt is the equal of any novel written in English in the present century. The tourist therefore must make his choice between two alternatives. Either there is no profound difference between English and American writers, and their experience is so similar that it can be housed in the same form, or Mr. Lewis has modeled himself so closely upon the English. H. G. Wells is a very obvious master, that he has sacrificed his American characteristics in the process. But the art of reading would be simpler and less adventurous than it is if writers could be parceled out in strips of green and blue. Study of Mr. Lewis more and more convinces us that the surface appearance of downright decision is deceptive, the outer composure hardly holds together the warring elements within, the colors have run. For though Babbitt would appear as solid and authentic a portrait of the American businessman as can well be painted, certain doubts run across us and shake our conviction. But, we may ask, where all is so masterly, self-assured, and confident, what foothold can there be for doubt to lodge upon? To begin with we doubt Mr. Lewis himself, we doubt, that is to say, that he is nearly as sure of himself or of his subject as he would have us believe. For he, too, though in a way very different from Mr. Anderson's way, is writing with one eye on Europe, a division of attention which the reader is quick to feel and resent. He too has the American self-consciousness, though it is masterfully suppressed and allowed only to utter itself once or twice in a sharp cry of bitterness. Babbitt was as much amused by the antiquated provincialism as any proper Englishman by any American. But the uneasiness is there. He has not identified himself with America, rather he has constituted himself the guide and interpreter between the Americans and the English, and, as he conducts his party of Europeans over the typical American city, of which he is a native, and shows them the typical American citizen, to whom he is related. He is equally divided between shame at what he has to show and anger at the Europeans for laughing at it. Zenith is a despicable place, but the English are even more despicable for despising it. In such an atmosphere intimacy is impossible. All that a writer of Mr. Lewis's powers can do is to be unflinchingly accurate and more and more on his guard against giving himself away. Accordingly, never was so complete a model of a city made before. We turn on the taps and the water runs, we press a button and cigars are lit and beds warmed. But this glorification of machinery, this lust for toothpastes, socks, tires, cameras, instantaneous hot water bottles, at first the signs, then the substitutes for joy and passion and wisdom is only a device for putting off the evil day which Mr. Lewis sees looming ahead. However he may dread what people will think of him, he must give himself away. Babbitt must be proved to possess some share in truth and beauty, some character, some emotion of his own, or Babbitt will be nothing but an improved device for running motor cars, a convenient surface for the display of mechanical ingenuity. To make us care for Babbitt, that was his problem. With this end in view Mr. Lewis shamefacedly assures us that Babbitt has his dreams. Stout though he is, this elderly businessman dreams of a fairy child waiting at a gate. Her dear and tranquil hand caressed his cheek. He was gallant and wise and well-beloved, warm ivory were her arms, and beyond perilous moors the brave sea glittered. But that is not a dream, that is simply the protest of a man who has never dreamed in his life, but is determined to prove that dreaming is as easy as shelling peas. What are dreams made of, the most expensive dreams? Seas, fairies, moors? Well, he will have a little of each, and if that is not a dream, he seems to demand, jumping out of bed in a fury, what then is it? With sex relations and family affection he is much more at ease. Indeed it would be impossible to deny that if we put our ears to his shell, the foremost citizen in Zenith can be heard moving cumbrously but unmistakably within. One has moments of affection for him, moments of sympathy and even of desire that some miracle may happen, the rock be cleft asunder, and the living creature, with his capacity for fun, 
suffering, and happiness, be set at liberty. But no, his movements are too sluggish, Babbitt will never escape, he will die in his prison, bequeathing only the chance of escape to his son. In some such way as this, then, the English tourist makes his theory embrace both Mr. Anderson and Mr. Sinclair Lewis. Both suffer as novelists from being American, Mr. Anderson, because he must protest his pride, Mr. Lewis, because he must conceal his bitterness. Mr. Anderson's way is the less injurious to him as an artist, and his imagination is the more vigorous of the two. He has gained more than he has lost by being the spokesman of a new country, the worker in fresh clay. Mr. Lewis it would seem was meant by nature to take his place with Mr. Wells and Mr. Bennett, and had he been born in England would undoubtedly have proved himself the equal of these two famous men. Denied, however, the richness of an old civilization, the swarm of ideas upon which the art of Mr. Wells has battened, the solidity of custom which has nourished the art of Mr. Bennett, he has been forced to criticize rather than to explore, and the object of his criticism, the civilization of Zenith was unfortunately too meager to sustain him. Yet a little reflection, and a comparison between Mr. Anderson and Mr. Lewis, put a different color on our conclusion. Look at Americans as an American, see Mrs. Opal Emerson Murgay as she is herself, not as a type and symbol of America displayed for the amusement of the condescending Britisher, and then, we dimly suspect, Mrs. Murgay is no type, no scarecrow, no abstraction. Mrs. Murgay is, but it is not for an English writer to say what. He can only peep and peer between the chinks of the barrier and hazard the opinion that Mrs. Murgay and the Americans generally are, somehow, human beings into the bargain. That suspicion suddenly becomes a certainty as we read the first pages of Mr. Ring Lardner's You Know Me, Al, and the change is bewildering. Hitherto we have been kept at arm's length, reminded constantly of our superiority, of our inferiority, of the fact, anyhow, that we are alien blood and bone. But Mr. Lardner is not merely unaware that we differ, he is unaware that we exist. When a crack player is in the middle of an exciting game of baseball he does not stop to wonder whether the audience likes the color of his hair. All his mind is on the game. So Mr. Lardner does not waste a moment when he writes in thinking whether he is using American slang or Shakespeare's English, whether he is remembering fielding or forgetting fielding whether he is proud of being American or ashamed of not being Japanese, all his mind is on the story. Hence all our minds are on the story. Hence, incidentally, he writes the best prose that has come our way. Hence we feel at last freely admitted to the society of our fellows. That this should be true of you know me, Al, a story about baseball, a game which is not played in England, a story written often in a language which is not English, gives us pause. To what does he owe his success? Besides his unconsciousness and the additional power which he is thus free to devote to his art, Mr. Lardner has talents of a remarkable order. With extraordinary ease and aptitude, with the quickest strokes, the surest touch, the sharpest insight, he lets Jack Keefe the baseball player cut out his own outline, fill in his own depths, until the figure of the foolish, boastful, innocent athlete lives before us. As he babbles out his mind on paper there rise up friends, sweethearts, the scenery, town, and country, all surround him and make him up in his completeness. We gaze into the depths of a society which goes its ways intent on its own concerns. There, perhaps, is one of the elements of Mr. Lardner's success. He is not merely himself intent on his own game, but his characters are equally intent on theirs. It is no coincidence that the best of Mr. Lardner's stories are about games, for one may guess that Mr. Lardner's interest in games has solved one of the most difficult problems of the American writer, it has given him a clue, a center, a meeting place for the diverse activities of people whom a vast continent isolates, whom no tradition controls. Games give him what society gives his English brother. Whatever the precise reason, Mr. Lardiner at any rate provides something unique in its kind, something indigenous to the soil, which the traveler may carry off as a trophy to prove to the incredulous that he has actually been to America and found it a foreign land. But the time has come when the tourist must reckon up his expenses and experiences, and attempt to cast up his account of the tour as a whole.
At the outset let us admit that our impressions are highly mixed and the opinions we have come to, if anything, less definite, less assured than those with which we started. For when we consider the mixed origin of the literature we are trying to understand, its youth, its age, and all those currents which are blowing across the stream of its natural development, we may well exclaim that French is simpler, English is simpler, all modern literatures are simpler to sum up and understand than this new American literature. A discord lies at the root of it, the natural bent of the American is twisted at the start. For the more sensitive he is, the more he must read English literature, the more he reads English literature, the more alive he must become to the puzzle and perplexity of this great art which uses the language on his own lips to express an experience which is not his and to mirror a civilization which he has never known. The choice has to be made, whether to yield or to rebel. The more sensitive, or at least the more sophisticated, the Henry Jameses, the Hergé Shamers, the Edith Whartons, decide in favor of England and pay the penalty by exaggerating the English culture, the traditional English good manners, and stressing too heavily or in the wrong places those social differences which, though the first to strike the foreigner, are by no means the most profound. What their work gains in refinement it loses in that perpetual distortion of values, that obsession with surface distinctions, the age of old houses, the glamour of great names, which makes it necessary to remember that Henry James was a foreigner if we are not to call him a snob. On the other hand, the simpler and cruder writers, like Walt Whitman, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Masters, decide in favour of America, but truculently, self-consciously, protestingly, showing off as the nurses would say, their newness, their independence, their individuality. Both influences are unfortunate and serve to obscure and delay the development of the real American literature itself. But, some critics would interpose, are we not making mountains out of mole hills, conjuring up distinctions where none exist? The real American literature in the time of Hawthorne, Emerson, and Lowell was much of a piece with contemporary English literature, and the present movement towards a national literature is confined to a few enthusiasts and extremists who will grow older and wiser and see the folly of their ways. But the tourist can no longer accept this comfortable doctrine, flattering though it be to his pride of birth. Obviously there are American writers who do not care a straw for English opinion or for English culture, and write very vigorously nonetheless, witness Mr. Lardner, there are Americans who have all the accomplishments of culture without a trace of its excess, witness Miss Willa Cather, there are Americans whose aim it is to write a book of their own bat and no one else's, witness Miss Fanny Hurst. But the shortest tour, the most superficial inspection, must impress him with what is of far greater importance, the fact that where the land itself is so different, and the society so different, the literature must needs differ, and differ more and more widely as time goes by from those of other countries. American literature will be influenced, no doubt, like all others, and the English influence may well predominate but clearly the English tradition is already unable to cope with this vast land, these prairies, these cornfields, these lonely little groups of men and women scattered at immense distances from each other, these vast industrial cities with their skyscrapers and their night signs and their perfect organization of machinery. It cannot extract their meaning and interpret their beauty. How could it be otherwise? The English tradition is formed upon a little country, its centre is an old house with many rooms each crammed with objects and crowded with people who know each other intimately, whose manners, thoughts, and speech are ruled all the time, if unconsciously, by the spirit of the past. But in America there is baseball instead of society? instead of the old landscape which has moved men to emotion for endless summers and springs, a new land, its tin cans, its prairies, its cornfields flung disorderly about like a mosaic of incongruous pieces waiting order at the artist's hands, while the people are equally diversified into fragments of many nationalities. To describe, to unify, to make order out of all these severed parts, a new art is needed and the control of a new tradition that both are in process of birth the language itself gives us proof. For the Americans are doing what the Elizabethans did, they are coining new words. They are instinctively making the language adapt itself to their needs. In England, save for the impetus given by the war, the word coining power has lapsed, 
Our writers vary the meters of their poetry, remodel the rhythms of prose, but one may search English fiction in vain for a single new word. It is significant that when we want to freshen our speech we borrow from America, poppycock, rambunctious, flip-flop, booster, good mixer, all the expressive ugly vigorous slang which creeps into use among us first in talk, later in writing, comes from across the Atlantic. Nor does it need much foresight to predict that when words are being made, a literature will be made out of them. Already we hear the first jars and dissonances, the strangled difficult music of the prelude. As we shut our books and look out again upon the English fields a strident note rings in our ears. We hear the first love making and the first laughter of the child who was exposed by its parents 300 years ago upon a rocky shore and survived solely by its own exertions and is a little sore and proud and diffident and self-assertive in consequence and is now on the threshold of man's estate. End of the essay. Thank you.